he's coming our way. Hopefully we can scare him away. Look at that, woke up alive again today. <laughs> Crazy. Just keeps happening. One day it's not gonna. It's frustrating being aware of that because you start feeling like you got no time to get anything done. <laughs> but anyway, a couple quick thoughts. Grounding. Um, I heard from a few different various people that grounding yourself out is, is actually uh, Quite helpful, can be potentially quite helpful. Grounding, meaning taking your shoes and socks off and get outside and stick your feet in the dirt and the grass. And I do it. I don't know why I thought about that, I just did. <laughs> thought I'd pass that on, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of people realize that that is actually a good thing for you. Another side note, so this morning I was woken up at about six something to a low flying plane. Sound like a twin prop. Sound like one of those beavers, the one in my in my opening videos from the bush plane. Sounded somewhat like that. And it was flying low, low grids. <whistles> Loud as shit. Sunday morning. I'm like, what's going on? This must be the spray. Because there were signs up in our community saying they were going to spray <laughs> the uh, the air to land on the ground because of some kind of a moth. Apparently the moth eats trees, leaves, whatever. It's kind of odd because I was on, I was out at on the coast while that was going down here, the main part. And uh, Sarah said, "Oh, they sure that it was organic, but they also advised people to stay indoors." And uh, I heard from a few people, it was almost like a war zone. This plane going back and forth doing grids low over a community. And then I try to get in tune to the common sense of it. I'm like, okay, hold on a minute. So they're spraying where there is people, or the community, but they're not spraying out here in the woods where I was. Never have, never seen them do it once. What's up with that, right? No, not, not the word conspiracy does not fit here at all. What does fit is, what's going on, man? So you're spraying chemicals over top of where there is a population of human beings, but you're saying it's for these moths that kill trees and etc. Doesn't add up for me. My gut's burning a little bit. And then by fluke, I was I was doing something and came across a video of a man, an interview of the man. His name was Bill Vanderzam. He used to be the premier of British Columbia, so that would have been the equivalent of the governor to the state, to a state. And he's being interviewed about the chemtrails. I've had a lot of people who are really avid chemtrail activists interested in it, trying to bring awareness to it, and uh, I, I do not know, I know a couple of people who would non-stop send me stuff that I grew up with, and then sure enough I, I listened to this interview, and he said that he was urged to look into the chemtrail thing, spraying of our atmosphere, and sure enough he said he went straight to the, our, the head of our, our government and used the uh, Freedom of Information Act, it took him a long time, but he finally, and it took him a lot of pressure, he finally got the papers, but he said that there was numerous pages where everything's blacked out, blacked out, blacked out, blacked out, blacked out, blacked out. So there you go, that's straight down the pipe. So if everybody thinks, oh, it's just a bunch of people trying to conjure up some kind of, some kind of shit. Well, I heard it straight from the Premier of British Columbia. And he looked into the chemtrail thing, the spraying of our atmosphere, and sure enough, there is something dark and dirty going on <laughs> with that, too. Not that we don't have any other dark and dirty things going on, right? But anyway, it's kind of coincidental. So uh, I got this plane on video this morning. Holy cow, but it's nonstop. I, he finally turned it off, flew away a little bit ago here. I think he went at it for an hour and a half, flying low grids over our uh, farm areas, streets, houses. Kind of odd, right? Kind of odd. Anyway, that was my morning. So now, I gotta get some voices heard. Is it is it actually a bad thing to kill kittens? <laughs> I'm kidding. But holy shit, these little kittens are on a rampage and they can't be contained. Can't let them out of the house. 
Sarah and her daughter are back tomorrow. They're the kitten ringleaders. And but the kittens are they're shredding the frickin' house apart. Eating everything. Sarah's Frenchy bulldog won't go near his bowl because all these little furry little rats are all over his food. They're eating everything. The instructions were for the daughter's room downstairs. Oh, just make sure the bowl's full down here and the water's full. Feed them twice a day, blah, blah, blah. Okay, <laughs> well, I've been doing that, but they are not downstairs. They are freaking everywhere, ripping around through the night. They're, they're everywhere. They're going insane. So when they get home, there's going to be some kitten deliveries going down ASAP, I'll tell you what. They're cute little bastards, but I'll tell you, when they're ripping around all hours of the night, all right, that's all my complaints for the day. It's a great day to be alive. I'm glad everybody's alive today, together here. Now, have another slip of caffeine. I found a folder. This is my new phone. I just I got it updated with iCloud, and I've got all these files on here. This is April the 21. Uh-oh, where'd it go? Here is one titled Photos. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey Steve, I came across your channel a couple days ago and wanted to share some photos that I've had for several years now. These photos were sent to me from a friend roughly 10 years ago now. The photos are of a de decaying animal slash creature taken by my friend's family. The story goes as I remember. A few of my friend's family members hiking on a trail near Mount St. Helens came across a dead carcass. They couldn't identify it properly due to the stage of decay it was in and also the size of it. The hind feet were also hard to identify due to its bizarre nails and placement of its toes. They called Fish and Game to come out. About an hour and a half to two hours later, a black unmarked SUV showed up instead. And two, what looked to be government agents got out. Without saying anything, they bagged up the remains and left without saying anything. I'm from the Washington State. I've hunting... I think you meant I have hunted, not much, hiked, backpacked, and camped, all in that region. I'm not experienced, but also not naive to the animal and wildlife we have here. I've asked more experienced hunters what they thought. The answer, I get answers like, interesting, never seen that before, with a little enthusiasm with little enthusiasm. Always. Sorry. Anyways, you get it. It's not something I can identify myself. Maybe you can. All right, let me have a look. <clears throat> Excuse me. First look. First picture. Right away. That is what looks like. That's what the toes and the claws look like on a bear when the claws have decayed, obviously, separated from the carcass. That is what is inside the bear claw. All right, and that first photo, that is possibly is the front paw. And let's have a look at the second photo. It's the same one, first, second, yeah. So there's the rear paw, and those are the sheaths left over from the bear claws. All right, I'm guessing those are the two different feet. I'm trying to go back and forth, look at the cedar. There's cedar underneath both the feet. You got the black stick by that. Oh, you're poking it with the stick. All right, anyway, it's bear. Done deal. Done deal. I appreciate that uh, you didn't have that much experience. That's fun. There's nothing to be embarrassed about if you can't identify something, you guys. Big deal. That's why we're all here. Send it to somebody who might have the answers. Send it, send it to somebody who's got a pile of experience and see you come up with, right? Get a lot of those. A lot of bear paws show up as alleged Sasquatch feet. A lot. And people, yeah, all right. I gotta start shutting up. I gotta start reading more. It's way too many people waiting that need to be heard more than my voice. Hi there, not sure how I found your channel, but I did. I love the way you tell a story. I'm not a hunter and have only shot my nine mil. I'm not sure why I never got it hunting. I fish constantly on the Rogue River in Southern Oregon. I lived in a tiny gold mining town of 350 people. Off and on, I make my way here looking for interesting things to photograph or video. I found myself in an old pioneer cemetery that had a collection of 
graves from the mid-1800s to mid-1900s. No one was around, and the gate was easy to climb over. The cemetery is buried in the woods and had no signs or anything. I worked my way to the back of the cemetery at the edge of the fence line. I was basically finished taking I was basically finished taking pictures and was standing facing thick shrub brush and trees. Suddenly, I heard a loud, really, really loud guttural she shrieking scream or something. My blood ran cold. I've never felt that kind of fear. When I'm not taking nature pictures, I'm working as an independent journalist and videographer. I take video in the middle of riots. I've had just about everything from eggs to homemade IEDs in pint canning jars thrown at me. I was targeted and nearly killed when my cover was blown after about five months of infiltrating a violent group of, well, not good people. That was, it was terrifying until I got knocked out. And it was scary as hell to be hunted by the same people who botched the attempt on me due to help from the last person I would have thought would help me. The reason I bring that up is because the fear I have felt when risking my life for my work is a completely different fear that I felt in the woods that day. I can't really say how it felt different, it just did. No comparison. The first scream was not enough to make me leave. I wanted to photograph whatever was coming my way. But after the second scream, I had to leave. So I walked slowly back across the cemetery, keeping, keeping facing the place the screams came from. I figured if I turned my back even just to walk, I would have been dead. I didn't stop watching until my car was running and I was ready to drive. That was a couple years ago. I'm back in Oregon recovering from knee surgery, but as soon as I can, I plan to go back to the same place and look around. You have an amazing channel. While I'm not a hunter, I have a great respect for those that do. Oh good, That's, thanks for the support, man. Cheers and keep up the great storytelling, Keith. Okay, Keith, listen, man. Be careful what you look into, obviously. I'm not going to tell you that, but you've heard enough here. You've heard enough here to uh, put a, a bunch of those puzzle pieces together for that cemetery, right? And uh, we've mentioned a handful of times of how it's not that easy to put the significance of hearing those screams on text to deliver through a, a red email to the people on here. But it's freaking significant, right? I'm picking it up. I mean, I have heard a few vocal sounds that weren't wolves, weren't human beings in the woods, but I haven't heard, and I couldn't, I can't mimic them, but I haven't heard the, the intimidating rib-shaking screams myself yet. I don't want to. Maybe from a couple miles away from a mountaintop, maybe, but that's about it. So what I'm saying is I appreciate what you're putting down, Keith. I get it, man. Be safe out there. Whatever you do, be safe. This is titled, Almost Taken by Something in a Park in Broad Daylight. Hey, Steve. People call me PW. And I couldn't care less if you use my name. <laughs> PW. Okay, man. We, uh... We used to razz each other when getting new girlfriends with that term, meaning we are whipped. You know, the first P stood for. It's kind of funny. Anyway, the story I'm about to share isn't the normal Bigfoot encounter. I'm not even sure it was Bigfoot. It just feels like Bigfoot wasn't involved. The year was 2007, and my wife, daughter, and I were visiting my in-laws in Brookings, Oregon. It was about a 12-hour drive from Sacramento, California, after you considered all the potty breaks that accompany traveling with a five-year-old and a pregnant wife unbelievably nerve-wracking having to stop every 45 minutes to pee. <laughs> Anyhow, on the second day there, my father-in-law told us of a park not too far away that we could have a picnic and our daughter could play. This park was nestled up to the mountains, which are pretty dense and vast. As I was looking around this particular, as I was looking around, this particular bush caught my eye. It started shaking like a peacock's plumage when it's trying to attract a mate. It was almost seductive. Everything got quiet. The sound of the kids playing in the park became muffled. The bush felt alive. It's all I could look at. I tried, but couldn't turn away. 
I was straight up hypnotized. Steve the frickin' Bush called to me in my head. It said, come closer. There's something you should see. I took two steps and it said, that's right, come closer. And at that point, I had zero control of my faculties. It kept shaking. At that point, my father-in-law walked up behind me and grabbed my left shoulder. He says, I whipped around. Sorry. He says, I whipped around with a dazed look and drew back my fist like I was going to hit him. Steve, I could give two shits if anyone believes me. For real. Like, I really don't care. I wrote you this as therapy for myself in tears, by the way. What was it, Steve? What wanted to come, wanted me to come to that bush? Why me? There's at least 10 kids playing in that park at the time. Way easier targets than me. I felt if I would have made it around that bush, I wouldn't be here today. This is 100% real and 100% something I think about every day. That's what you do, Steve. Please be safe. Please be safe right back at you, man. That's creepier than shit. And, uh, I'm definitely not the guy that would have the answer to what was that. You know what I mean? Dave Pilatus comes to mind. He might have an idea. He is very, very diligent looking into the missing people thing. The abnormal missing people thing. But we had so many people have shared with everybody here as children being beckoned to come outside and play out their bedroom window in the nighttime when their parents are in bed and everybody's in bed and something out there is trying to get them to come out. That is so alarming. The muffled sound. Sounds getting muffled out. Everything's going quiet. Can't even hear a creak. That's a pattern. With a lot of people here have reported that. All of a sudden everything went dead quiet. Couldn't even hear the water. Right? That's a pattern that you can't ignore. What's going on, you guys? So what's going on when that happens? What's changing around a human being when the sound's getting muffled when they're in the, in the woods in a park or whatever? What do you guys think that is? The sound's getting muffled. Are we entering some different level of vibration? How, what about, uh, what about, how about this one? The people that have this happen, is it the person's vibration that is changing? And if so, how? How do you change your vibration? I wonder how. How do you manipulate your vibration to change that you could possibly be along parallel with some other place? It's very, very confusing. I, right? It's very confusing. To figure out when you have absolute zero clue, no education on the topic, no nothing, trying to figure this shit out. It's frustrating, right? I'm glad you're still here with us. I don't envy that experience. I hope it never happens again. And if anybody has the answer to this, or has had the same exact, same, or very, very similar experience, maybe throw it down in the comment section below for this man, or email it to me, alright? Very unnerving. I hope this helps here in your story. Share it here where it's safe, and it brings us some, a little more peace. And uh, you might want to possibly get some tools from someone so that you can use those tools to bring your mind more peace and um, not be as stressed as you currently are, currently was, anyway, right, man? Emails back to whatever else you learn, right? Here's another one. Steve, like many, I'd like to share a story, and it's one of many, however... This one is different than all my other and different than any other I've ever seen or heard. I have a picture. It, it's close up, it's detailed, and it makes, your laser, makes you laser focus on it and say, what the hell is that? I'd be happy to share that picture with you. No one else has it for some reason. It's like I feel I owe it to whatever this is, not to just air it out to be laughed at. To be laughed out? Sorry, a couple typos. In an area I hunt in southeast Idaho, I have multiple encounters that are just feelings. Whatever this is, it's there a lot. If it's what's causing the odd feelings I get in the spot. The feelings are from peace, mild anxiety, extreme focus, 
knowing something is about to happen before it happens, and doing me, doing things there that I don't realize to later why I did them. I've also had confusion there. Upset stomach, burst of energy as if nothing could stop me, and the list goes on. But the picture on my trail cam of a human-like creature that was following right behind me defies explanation. The odd thing is, I don't need an explanation and feel a sense, sense of honor. It's picked me. This thing is big, really big. Huge muscles that are much like a human, but not at the same time. Has hair on its head like a human, but a flat top head. The pec muscle tie right into the biceps. Its neck is almost not there, and the muscle come off the back of the head into a very thick upper body. If you see the picture that is from about, if you see the picture that is from about 20 feet away, you will see the same thing I'm seeing. I'd love to show you. Now the story. Oh, five years ago, I cut a trail off the mountaintop to the bottom. It's a very easy hike compared to taking the natural route in the valley floor. Route, probably. To mark this trail, I marked a tree with my knife. I stood there for a minute, thinking of what to cut into the tree. I felt I should cut an upside-down triangle. Why? That never crossed my mind. It's grown into the tree now because I did it five years ago. The picture I have, Steve, this being is clothed. Odd, close, but it's not naked. What's as odd as get the picture is the fact it has the same upside triangle on its chest that I cut on the tree. Exactly the same. I can show you the tree and the picture both. On the same day I got the trail cam picture and this thing was on the trail right behind me which is shown in timestamps on the pictures. I stopped at a log that fell across the trail. I don't know why, but I take a break on the way up and the way down by sitting on this log. I remember the leaves falling. It would fall, it was fall, and the aspen leaves were dropping as normal. While I was sitting on the log, one leaf fell close to me and hit my hand, and then fell to the ground. You know the speed a leaf drops. It's fast, right? I thought nothing of it at all. Why would I? A few days later, I had a dream of sitting on that log and the leaves were falling. I was dreaming that that event in detail. Then, time slowed down, way down. The leaf that, the leaf that fell, there's a bunch of typos, okay? But we're, we're going to get this. Sitting on the log, I was dreaming, then the time slowed down, way down. The leaf that fell close came into my view and my eyes followed it. I saw every flicker, seeing both sides of the leaf in very slow falling motion as it got closer to my hand. I saw it hit my hand and go on to down to the ground where it landed at the toe of my boot. I remember the spots in the leaf that looked like mold spots, the veins on the leaf, a little chip that was out of the leaf on the right edge. At the time it landed in the dream, I felt a firm touch in the back of my head and it was like whatever was touching me told me without words, Remember that. What the hell, Steve? It makes the hair stand up on my arms just to tell you this. I think whatever this is touched me, and I didn't ever know it was there. But it's not that I just remembered it. I remember seeing something I didn't know I saw. Things happen at a pace our minds do not process fast enough. Somehow, my mind retrieved what I saw in the most graphic detail, like a very slow motion camera. Something happened that day that was not normal, or what I would say is normal, but it happened, and this thing made it happen that way. Reality was removed by this being, and it gave me a window into the things I see that I normally never realized I see them. My number is, call me, and I'll share the picture. It'll stun you. I have a picture that I don't think anyone else has ever captured, and it's not the detent picture we have all seen on TV of what they call Bigfoot. This is right in front of my camera and it's creepy lol. Came out. Um, I don't call people. <laughs> I get phone numbers. I get phone numbers emailed to me from strangers non-stop and I don't call them all right. So if you want to share the photo with me 
send it an email, right? Those are, that's, those are, those are a pretty bold description of the email, of the photos that you have in your possession. And I don't know why you wouldn't share them with the email that you sent to me. I don't know why. So, if you want to send them, send them. If you want to share them with all the people, share them with all the people here through me. All right, man? All right, here's another one. Coincidentally, this has three photos with it. All right, let me mark this as red. Hello, Steve. I wanted to share a picture with you and all the other people that enjoy your YouTube channel. Years ago, 2006, as posted on one of your as posted on one of your pictures, uh, on one of pictures, my son and I were at Mount St. Helens, Washington. We pulled up the main road to try to get a picture of two deer we saw on hillside. The camera I used to take this I used to take this picture was a small Canon QuickShot pocket camera. The one picture has been edited two times to help see what I accidentally caught in the picture of the two deer running up the hill. In a small tree to the left of the deer, there is something in the tree. Using the picture, picture editing on my computer, I expanded on the tree. There are two blue marble looking orbs on both sides of the tree. I expanded on the tree to see what was in the tree. There's an Indian figure in the tree. From what I can see is that the Indian is kneeling down and he's looking over his left shoulder. I would have been on his left side. You can see the headband, his face, the light on the bridge of his nose and on his chin. A shadow under his chin. There is a skull on his left shoulder and a half of a girl's face by his left bicep. I can see what looks like strands hanging from his sleeve and his left hand is making a loose fist. There's just too much detail in this evenly proportioned image to be one of those things that if you squint and use your imagination, you can make out an image. An Indian image is really there. And the two blue orbs on both sides of the tree. Yes, I drive the hundred miles. I, I did drive the hundred miles the very next weekend to the exact same spot to get a better look at this tree. The tree is a small tree, about 12 inches in diameter. No carving of an Indian. Just to see if I could get another accidental image, I stood in the same spot and used the same camera and shot a few random pictures. When I got home, I uploaded the pictures onto my computer. There's no orbs or Indian. I even stood in front of the tree and snapped a picture of the tree, point blank, no Indian. I feel that I froze time for that split second when I snapped the picture of the two deer running up the hillside. I sure hope you can see all that I see in the figure in the tree. Share it if you want to. I just thought it's sort of tied in with the strange things that can happen while enjoying Mother Nature. I really enjoy listening to you reading the experiences. People write to share Lanny. All right. Um, those are two bull elk. And these definitely could possibly be orbs. I don't know. Um, it's raining. It's moisture in the air. I'm not the guy, right? I'm not the guy to dissect the photographs. <clears throat> I'll tell you what, I'll share them. I'll share them. I have a funny feeling some of you might give me shit for sharing this email, but... What the hell, I'll share it. I'm, a, I'm, I'm just not the right guy to share some of these photos with because I just do not see what people are seeing. And if I don't see what they're seeing, I seem to catch the uh, catch the shit and the hate and the anger from the people who send it. I don't know why. But anyways, consider shared. There you go. Um, am I seeing an Indian in all that detail myself? No, not yet. Not on here. Maybe once I get to the edit program, I'll have a closer look. But we'll see what the people say. All right. Mark, this is red. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is titled, Terror Out of Nowhere, Then Words in My Head. Hi, Steve. Love your channel. And like so many others, I leap on every new video you post. Thank you for what you do for everyone all over the world. I'm in Australia. I'm a woman, and I drive 
four-wheel drive and camp solo around the backcountry in Australia. My story doesn't have a sighting and is about an experience only about a minute long, but I'm sharing anyway because it might be helpful to someone else. Perfect. I love the roaming and the huge skies so much that I often have trouble actually stopping driving to camp for the night. So occasionally I just drive deep into the night and then pull up somewhere off the road or a track and sleep inside my truck instead of setting up the rooftop tent. So one night about three years ago I did this. I was in Queensland, miles from anywhere, and it was close to 2 a.m. I pulled off the road to have a couple of hours snooze inside the truck. I found a spot only meters from the road I was on that had a few trees that were bushy right down to the ground and provided a nice little hiding spot. I crawled the truck in with the spotlights on, had a good look around, decided it was awesome. I turned the truck around so I was facing back out towards the road. <clears throat> Excuse me. I put the driver's window down a bit and put a towel in the door jam to block sight in through the window, just in case, you know, I'm a woman out there on my own. I have my little safety things I do. All the other windows are tinted and almost impossible to see in, especially in the dark. I snuggled in my, into my inside sleeping spot and lay there, barely seeing the dark interior of my vehicle, smiling, feeling stoked about the day's traveling and pondering the next day's direction. Within probably five minutes of this, I suddenly began to feel really scared. I was scared too easily, but this feeling came out of nowhere, fast and intense. It quickly grew into a panic, panicky feeling of terror. I tried for a few moments to talk myself out of it, but I was also really aware of how unusual this was for me. Then I heard loud in my head, get out now, go now, go, leave, get out of here now, go, now, now, leave. I thought to myself, F, I'm actually terrified I'm out of here. And I left into the driver's seat and got the hell out of there. I didn't even take the towel out of the door first. And before I even reached fourth gear, the feeling of terror was completely gone, like it had never been there. I drove another 50k, found a wide open spot, and pulled in there for my sleep. I've thought about this a lot since then. I didn't see or hear anything outside the truck. Just the loud words in my head. And being someone with big respect for nature, both known and unknown, I'm still glad I left when I did. I've had other little things happen. <clears throat> I had a green marble appear on my desk at home. I've had a small light bop around inside my vehicle, appearing and disappearing while I drove about a 10k stretch. I've had dead silence when stopping on a four-wheel drive track for a leg stretch while deep inside one of my local national parks. All could be nothing, of course. But thanks to your channel, and our Australian Yowie Audio Reports channel, plus Scott's channel, Dave's channel, my eyes and mind are open, and I'd be careful out there and always side with caution. But I'm not about to stop going out there. Thanks again for all you do, Steve. Don't say my name, please. Okay. Gotcha. Ontario Bigfoot, Ontario Sasquatch. Sorry. Um, that man has been documenting the marble thing for quite some time and other things appearing inside of his home. Uh, numerous people have had the lights. You're not alone on that one. Um, the voice in the head. It comes up quite often, right? What's up with that one? We might have some answers fairly soon, I hope. Direct, solid answers that we can all somewhat accept. I still haven't had that happen to me, and I'm, I'm not really craving it. Myself, will it happen to me? I don't know. <clears throat> you be safe out there, <laughs> ripping around by yourself like that. Make sure you're safe. Make sure you've got some kind of an equalizer with you, all right? Because so far, it's the human beings that are the most dangerous for women when they're out there alone. Make sure you have an equalizer with you, please. All right. What's this one? All right, this is titled Woods People. Let me title it as red. So many emails, you guys. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it freaking amazing? How many people? 
Hi Steve. I wrote to you before, but I know the grammar was awful since I did it on a cell phone. Plus, I know you get volumes of email every day. No worries. I've been aware of the woods people for a while now. And there are things that I have witnessed that I cannot explain any other way, except that I believe it is them. When I was a child in Northeast U.S., my dad spent a lot of time in the forest. I now know that when my father told me stories of seeing ball lightning moving through the forest or along the Paraline easement, that he was actually seeing orbs. I spent days upon days roaming in the forest. I knew where I was and the place was familiar. I would often stay out until after dark in the summer. I was not even afra I was not ever afraid. I loved it there. I felt truly at peace. Fast forward to my 20s and I was camping near the edge of the Smokies in Tennessee, early 1990s. I was in a 23-foot gooseneck RV with all the comforts of home, TV, kitchen, recliner, the works. We were staying at an RV park near the border of the National Park. I was awakened about 3 a.m. by the howls and screams in the forest that sounded, well, almost human, but not quite human. Of course, I was the only one in the RV that woke up hearing this, and my mind raced as I ticked through all the known woods creature sounds, and this wasn't any of them. And then, they got closer and closer, then stopped. What I heard next blew my mind. I heard a conversation. For all the world was a conversation, but the closer I listened, the less I could understand. It sounded like rapid fire gibberish back and forth, clearly of two separate voices with different tones and different characteristics. At that moment, I knew, but didn't really know what it was. This was before the internet for me, and what I knew of Sasquatch was from scary campfire stories meant to scare kids. I was more amazed and frightened. Am I really hearing the Sasquatch talk to one another? I tried to talk to the others in the RV with me next the next day, but they were reluctant to even go there about the, top, the subject. And no one admitted to hearing it, and they basically waved it off and dismissed it. No wall slapping, no rock throwing, but it sounded like it was right outside the window, no more than 20 feet away. Now in my 50s, I have a farm of my own, and I also spend as much time on the land as possible. I run a garden, eat game when I can, and forage in the woods for food. Nothing matches the packed nutrition of forest food. I bought the place about 10 years ago, and when I was first building the house, I would camp in the yard while the timber frame was going up. This kept me from driving back to the city every night and wasting a ton of windshield time. I was always solo, and I'd just take my little radio, my lamp, my lawn chair, and would watch the fireflies do their J-shaped swoop and listen. I wasn't afraid. I had a herd of sheep already on the place and two great Pyrenees dogs roaming around. Nothing was sneaking up on me. I slept hard due to the physical work that I was doing. But one night I woke up, no idea why, and then on cue... I heard a howl on the ridge line about one third a mile away. Nothing but hay field between me and that ridge. Lots of cows around this part of the country, but this had no cow sound to it. It was more like a deep voiced loud man, and I mean loud, <clears throat> yelling, ah! And it ran, I think, as it yelled in bursts, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> About six times as it covered the, about three quarters of a mile of that ridge line in about ten seconds. I kid you not, it went as fast as someone would, maybe in a truck, ATV, or a dirt bike, but no engine sound at all. And the weird part was that I knew the sound was meant for me and directed at me. And again, I was not afraid, and I merely thought, hmm, Sasquatch and immediately fell back to sleep. Of course, no one believed me when I told them what I had heard. In the years following, my son had the sense that he needed to poke his head out of his deer blind and witnessed a huge, dark, human-like figure crossing that same ridge line, but closer into us. Was it that sixth sense thing that caused him to want to put his head out of the blind and see what was to the side? Another time, it was near dark, and my sons were topping off the chicken feeders. We had portable coops without bottoms, so the manure goes straight into the hay field instead of cleaning them all the time. This time, the coops were near the edge of the field near a wooded area. When the boys were working, 
something loud and deep voiced repeatedly growled at them from the woods. They said whatever it was had big lungs. They threw the buckets down and ran for the house. I suspect something in the woods may have been upset because there is a grove of pawpaw fruit in there. And a couple days before, my boys had picked it clean. That wasn't very good sharing on our part. Another time, I was picking wild blackberries and had the sensation of being watched, followed by little pebbles thrown into the thicket right in front of me as I worked. I felt uneasy, so I sang a song to whatever it was and kept right on picking. We've periodically had sheep in the flock die, and I hauled them up to the woods at the back of the farm. One day later, I checked, and they are usually gone without so much as a drag mark or a puff of wool remaining. These are full-grown ewes and rams we've lost over the years. Been there, done that. With the dead sheep. Shared that on here before. Right now, I have to say that I have the unique unique experience of being around when trees fall. I've had probably 10 to mention. I've been standing outside in broad daylight and heard or saw trees in the near distance fall at least on three occasions. I've been camping and heard a tree fall nearby at night. Not a small tree either. I've been driving along out here on my way back to the farm only to be delayed for hours because I'm the first one to come upon a large diameter tree fully across the road. I went out for walks in the road near the farm, and on the way out, the road was clear. On the way back, there's a six-inch diameter rotted tree in the road where I had just been 15 minutes earlier. There's a patch of forest along the slope down to a nearby lake, and there are dozens of four to six-inch diameter trees scattered in this area, all broken off at about 12 feet off the ground. Safe to say at this point, I have a pretty good idea of what has happened. Side note, that's why I always mention everybody, you might want to keep a small chainsaw with you, right? when you're on those back roads, just for that reason. You don't need a big tree dumping behind you when you go up a forest service road or a remote road and coming back and boom, <clears throat> you're not going anywhere now. What are you going to do? I have formed some theories somewhat based on why some First Nations cultures warn not to talk about the woods people. It is based on logic. If a being is capable of sensing your presence and knowing your thoughts and intentions, would you really want to draw them to you by thinking of them, speaking of them, or possibly accidentally insulting them? If you can't handle what you may invite in, don't open the door. Agreed. If we have more intuition than we realize, perhaps some witnesses subconsciously protect their minds from intrusion by denying the incident or never speaking of it again. On the other hand, I watched a video of some Cherokee guys looking for Sasquatch. They talked about the old traditional relationship between Sasquatch and humans, where the Sasquatch would protect their hunting parties. The video said the village would leave gifts of food for the woods people to honor that relationship. And as for our gaze, humans have some really rash reactions to things that they lay their eyes upon. Really bad choices come from places of complete terror. I'm also personally cautious of the decisions a terrified person makes. Same. I realize that not all woods people are interested in getting to meet their human neighbors. <clears throat> if a human is able to contact them, I'm wondering if it isn't someone of their kind that is also more capable of handling meeting us. As to humans being run off an outdoor spot, off of an outdoor spot, we tend to blunder, pollute, spoil, and over harvest in many cases. Excuse me. If I, were woods, if I were a woods person trying to get by in the forest, I wouldn't want some goofy humans around messing up my hunting spot either. Get out now. Plus, the steady stream of human inner voice, our thoughts are always on. If this being can hear it, and can hear it approach for miles, maybe they just want us to shut up and leave. Enough of the mental jibber-jabber already. What I really wish for... Sorry. What I really wish for is to sit around a table with people and be able to discuss this, like it's an actual topic, and toss around what we know or don't know, etc. Maybe too much to ask, where no one gets laughed at or humiliated. I am interested in what has been known by First Nations for thousands of years, so we can go ahead and get used to it. Well, that's all for now. Good for you, Steve, to have a life-slash-career that you don't need to take a vacation from. 
I truly enjoy the views that I get to see in your videos. Thanks for putting that channel together. I know it's a lot of work. Best to you from somewhere in East Tennessee. Tennessee again. Tennessee again. All right, well, you definitely have the wheels turning for a lot of people, I'd imagine. And I like to think that this place is that place that you're hoping to find, although unfortunately we can't all talk to each other at the same time. I guess once I do the live thing, if we do that, I guess people can chat in a way, in a way right? Uh, I'm pretty sure this is that place, though. This is one of many where you can talk about it as it is factual, which it is. Which it is. All right. I appreciate you sending that in. And you, this is a while back. This is 2021. So if anything's changed since then, and you've learned anything significant that you think can help the people, you know what to do, right? If you would, if you would be generous to send that in to us. Man, we've got the mosquitoes around. I keep feeling like I got bugs around me. All right. Oh, I'm getting into a bunch of red. Well, that's good. So that tells me that everything I'm reading now possibly hasn't been read. All right, here we go. Let's mark this as red. This is titled Special Forces Steve. Hey Steve, thought I'd give you an update of what's happening here on our property. Your last two personal emails to me helped a lot. I now know how hard that was to do for me. As before, I don't want my name mentioned, as I still do the unarmed combat thing to militaries and police. Just a quick upgrade on my background to let you viewers know I'm not a guy who shakes easily. My first encounter was when I was 17 before I went in the service. I was snowmobiling in northern Ontario, going down a secondary road north of North Bay, doing about 30 miles per hour. I looked over to my right, and a large 8 to 10 blonde animal was running beside me. I shit myself. As a city boy at that time, I couldn't believe it. I pegged it to go about 60. All that the machines of that day could do. I caught up to the five people I was with, told them what I saw. They all looked at each other. We went back slow. Sure enough, we all saw it standing on a bank of snow, bobbing and weaving behind a too small tree. We burned back to the place we were staying. My girlfriend's relatives at the time. They all believed me. Turns out there was a lot of signs. Sorry, sorry. Turns out there was a lot of sightings in Cobalt, Ontario, of one of these beings over the last 80 years. They called him Old Yeller Top. I later found out. Fast forward 40 years, I never really thought too much about it. In the interim, I joined the U.S. military. My dad started a started a CO in the U.S., which gave us status. As my family is military family, and my dad is a paratrooper in the British Army, who went on to become SAS. He never even he never even to any of us other than he was a para. I joined the Airborne, the Rangers, and Special Forces. I served in a lot of hot spots, some black ops, some white. I've been wounded three times. The last one retired me in 87. So, I did the civilian thing, joined a big corporation as a junior exec. Only thing kept me going was hunting and fishing slash shooting comp competitively, competently. I retired, moved up North Ontario, where my wife was from. Paradise, hunting, fishing, on my almost private lake. Then one night, my wife wakes me up, says, Someone is outside. We are rural. We have several incursions on the property. I can't explain. As part of my job, I was trained to track by Australian SAFs. They are good. So, I grabbed my, what I call, my go belt. Shotgun rounds, slugs, nine pellet, double odd buck, and leg holster for browning. Ten round HP extra mag slash Randall number one and my trusty 870. I carry an 870 mostly for 
for mostly jungle ops. And I went out with a code to tell my wife, open the door, everything's okay. How do I go? Right away. If, figure it out. The wife put the real stinky garbage out, and it's a bear. Then the combat sixth sense kicks in. There's no sound. Something kicks on. I'm in combat mode again. I feel it. Sweep the area tactical. No heart pumping. In the bubble, we call it all the senses tuned. This will be important later. I go from tactical cover to cover. I go to the lawn, get down on my belly with a flashlight. I can see the push down grass with shadows like I have been taught. I know the strides are not man-made too big. I go in the house, tell her all's well. I do tell her later, sorry, I do, bracket, I do tell her later, your words resounded with me about warning your loved ones, end bracket. And then, stared, reattaching. I found out that years before, a cottage about five kilometers up the road was attacked. The couple took pictures that can be found on the internet. But as like you, they don't do anything for me. But what did pique my interest was the full investigation that lasted a week with MNR police, tactical officers, and the military slash helicopters. I have since talked with some involved in the involved the best I've got was a TAC cop told me at that time they were issued M16 with four thirty round mags. And the team searching was one cop, one MNR, one military gut per time. Guys per time, I'm guessing. There's a bunch of typos, okay, guys? If you haven't figured that out. But we'll get through it. A couple of local cops have said, I won't talk yet. I have a couple of years to retirement. Now, as to the sixth sense thing. I know mine was heightened to the point that one of my nicknames was Spooky in the SF because of some crazy shit that happened. That's for later. But I believe that was ever out... I believe that what what was what was ever out that night around my house knew what was in my heart and knew what was in knew what was in my heart and knew what was in my heart. It was not intentional. I just went into combat mode, and it knew it. He just had a story about a Lakota elder that said it knows what's in your heart, and of course, your mantra. I'm here, you're here, leave me alone, and I won't put bullets in your head. Which brings me to the last incident. I was walking in the back 40. We lost a cat and I was looking for it. I walked up on a being. It was only five feet tall. It looked right into my eyes. Then a large one stepped in front. I slowly pulled the 870 off my shoulder. Deliberately didn't take the safety off. We stared at each other. His face registered rage even more as I took the weapon in my hands. Thanks to you, I had a game plan. I said in my mind, you people are powerful. I do not want to go to war with you. You know I've been to war and won, so you don't want to war with me. I want to go in peace with you, but I will kill you right now without hesitation. I believe I saw its face soften and walk away. As I said in our email, Steve, I didn't want a war with these creatures, as I know no matter how much damage I inflict, I will lose. But as you, I won't back down from a fight. Or, first interaction, Steve, I begged for someone who can help. I know now I'm on my own. You help personally more than you'll ever know. Thank you from the bottom of this old, broken-down paratrooper's heart. Not likely, but if you ever get to Ontario, me casa su casa. Okay. That's quite the intense email, right? A few typos made it a little tough to get across, but we got it. And that was uh, a year ago. So, if you are still here with us, could you please email me back and let me know the update, what's going on around there? And as well, if you could, could you give us a, as best detailed description of what you saw standing there looking at you, if you would? A description of both those beings and the and the one that looked at you with rage. It's funny that 870. That's my go-to. I've got a, 
every time I've had to go after a wounded bear, wounded anything, that's what I've packed with me. It's very effective at close range for very large animals. Pretty intense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, if you could, if you're still with us, email me back, give us an update of what's going on around there. All right? I'd appreciate that. I hope it's all good. I hope you're still good. It's endless. It's freaking endless. All right, there's no title on this email. Hi, Steve. Even after listening to your channel for a while, this one still puzzles me. I live in a mobile home retirement community in central New York. Technically, we're in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains, which are about two to three hours away. We are rural, but there are four mobile communities and other homes along our road that is about seven miles long. I would not expect Sasquatch activity in an area this populated, but we are next to a state park land with somewhat more sparse populated areas around. One summer early fall night a couple of years ago, probably around midnight or after I started hearing a weird noise up behind our mobile home. It was a steady huffing and chuffing and wheezing sound. It almost sounded somewhat mechanical, but not really. It put me in mind slightly of an old steam locomotive, but it was obviously alive and moving down alongside of our home. This is one other home. There is one other home between ours and the state park property. I thought of a bear because I know there are black bears in the area. But I was pretty sure it wasn't that. Now here's the thing that convinces me to write you about this. <clears throat> Normally my instinct would be to look outside and see what it was, but I was scared stiff. The window in the living room was where I was sitting was open and I wasn't sure if I should try to close it or not. I turned to the lights and closed the window as quietly as I could, still very spooked out, not wanting to see what was coming down toward it. I had debated checking to see if my daughter was awake and hearing it, and finally started toward her bedroom door. As I approached it, she came out and said, Do you hear that? I said, Yeah. Neither of us had a clue what it was. She was freaked out too, and neither of us had a clue what it was. We didn't know about you or Dave Plyas back then, as whatever it was came past the window and toward the front of the trailer. It turned and went toward the parkland and the road that heads into the park. My daughter did look out her bedroom window to see if she could see it, but couldn't. It continued away from us and left, as did the fear. But the curiosity has remained to this day. Whatever it's worth, for whatever it's worth, thanks for you doing, thanks for not being intimidated. Stay safe. If you read this, please just use my first name, Linda. All right, Linda. Uh, you may want to possibly, if you're still here listening, is just go to your neighbors, look them square in the eye, and talk matter of fact, and ask them if they've heard or seen anything that's abnormal or scared the shit out of them in the, in the neighborhood, right? That's what I'd do if I were you. I'm glad you're safe. Here comes another one. My big fifth story in California is the title of this email. Uh, my name is Dion Childs. I hope at the end of this you don't tell me not to use your name. I live in San Jose, California. I know who's special, just a regular guy who loves to hunt and camp in the outdoors. I'm 50 years old, and I am a mechanic that works for a school district in Sunnyvale, California, in the Silicon Valley. I would say I'm a self-taught outdoorsman that has been hunting for many years. I wouldn't say I'm a very successful hunter, but I spend a lot of time in the outdoors with my brother deer hunting in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. I'd like to tell you my story. I've had two encounters with what I believe was with a Bigfoot Sasquatch in 2017. I went on a D6 hunting trip. Excuse me, D6. That must be mean a uh, conservation area in the state. In California, Kennedy Meadows with my brother Jason and good friend Rodney. It was a pack trip. I was super excited because this would be my first hunting trip on horse pack. Horse pack, horseback. It was a five day trip where we rode horseback below Levitt Lake near Levitt Meadows. The hunting was amazing. I was able to take a black bear and was super excited on the second night of the trip. However, on the third night, we experienced high wind and rain that woke me up at three in the morning. The weird thing is, everything went silent. 
and this weird feeling came over me, but I can't explain what it felt like. As I laid in my sleeping bag, I could hear footsteps around my tent. I was sleeping with my 357 handgun, and my brother and my friend also had handguns. I screamed out to my brother Jason to stop messing around, and he yelled back saying he's not doing anything, and that he's in his tent. I have to say, my mind started playing tricks on me, because after a while, I could feel a presence near me. I could hear footsteps crunching the ground near my tent. I laid in my tent trying to talk myself into opening up the tent as fast as I could to see what was behind my tent. The Four Season tent had two zippers and I knew it would take a little bit of time to get out of it. I slowly positioned myself to get out of the tent as fast as I could with my handgun in one hand and I turned my headlamp on to see what was out there. I ripped out of the tent as fast as I could and caught a glimpse of a dark black huge shadow that scared the shit out of me. I started firing off my handgun in the location where I saw the shadow. Not to kill it, but to scare whatever it was because I wanted it to leave me alone. I'm not sure what it was. I don't think it was a black bear because it stood pretty tall. I woke up my buddy Rodney and Jason and they said that I, I must have been dreaming. I don't know what I saw, but I believe it was a Bigfoot. The next morning when the sun came up, I went to go check the area where I saw the big, huge shadow. In this location, I had hung the black bear meat, I would say about 10 feet high on a pretty sturdy line. To my amazement, the meat bag was ripped off the line and on the ground. My brother and friend said it was probably a black bear that reached up there to grab it, but I don't believe that. There is no way it could have reached that high. Here's another encounter during the D5 hunting trip in 2020. It's kind of in the same location near Kennedy Meadows, but in Eagle Meadows near Relief Reservoir. There had been many wildfires and a lot of the forest land was closed down except for this location for the hunting open. And a lot of the hunters thought that area was closed down due to the wildfires. So, my brother and I had the place to ourselves for the hunting opener D5. We headed up on four-wheel drive quads, and I found a beautiful rock overlook and proceeded to hunt. I have to say that I started researching my experience from my previous hunting trip, so I was a little bit more aware of possible experiences to be had with Bigfoot. The area that I was at was filled with open-range cattle and was watching them feed through the canyon. I was laying on a rock when that strange feeling came over me again like it did at the last hunting trip in 2017. This time is around 5 a.m. and I started hearing the timber line crackling, cracking, as if the trees were falling down. I positioned my spotting scope in the location where I could hear the trees cracking, but never saw anything. I was too afraid to go into the tree line. I have to say this noise continued throughout the whole day. I'm not sure what it was, but it scared the piss out of me. My brother Jason thought it was the cattle moving through the tree line. I have to say it was pretty loud to be cattle knocking down branches off of the trees. I don't know what it was. The feeling I got is a gut feeling not to go in the timber line. I just find it kind of strange that I got these gut feelings as, a, as if danger was near. These experiences were in the Stanislaus National Forest, California. S-T-A-N-I-S-L-A-U-S. There you go. End of story. Thanks, man. I hope you're still out there hunting. Hope it didn't ruin it for you. Being terrified is not fun. It's not fun at all. There you go, though. Uh, I'm glad they sent the location, so we'll see if anyone else out there has had something weird happen in that location. And if they have, I'm sure it's a pretty, good, pretty high chance they're probably here listening to all the people, right? And if you are and you want to chime in, you know what to do. Share my story at howtohunt.com is where you can do it. Now, I am now going to go fire up the chainsaw and, well, i got to sharpen it again and uh, see if I can't get that pile of logs done. And then uh, I think in a couple days I'm going back out in the woods. I'm going to go back out to the coast and continue trying to harvest a large, mature past its prime bear for that meat. And then uh, I'll probably take you guys along with me. 
and uh, take it from there. I have to, my time's running out for the hunt, fishing's coming up, and I am going to cut loose, and I am possibly going to go to three different states soon. It won't be that long of a trip, but I'm going to go, and I'm going to bring all of you with me, and hopefully with all parties in agreement, we're going to videotape what we're going to talk about, and for the only purpose, which is to share that knowledge with all you guys. All right? And I will go and take you with me, and we will learn together. So there. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right, you guys? Um, if you're sitting there on the fence still, you should hopefully understand by now that it's actually quite painless to share your truth with the people. And on average so far, we haven't had... We haven't had one person email in that they wish they didn't share it with all of you. Not one person has ever said that. It's been the opposite. 100% of everybody who has made mention said that they ha they felt way better and actually experienced much relief when they heard their truth shared here with all of you. So there you go. Hope your weekend's a good one so far.